In this podcast, Sally Johnson, Manager of Food and Beverage at MPI, discusses verification outcomes and when to trust your judgment. Often, businesses just want to be told what to do by a verifier. But what does this mean exactly? Um, You're right, we do hear from businesses that they just want to be told what to do. Um, But one of the things is you can't take that statement just on face value. Um, When you actually sit down and have a bit of a chat to a food business, some food businesses um, do just want somebody to come in and give them um, a set of rules to follow, a set of prescriptive procedures to follow. Uh, and a lot of our guidance essentially does that. It gives them uh, you know, a set of things to follow. Um, but actually in issuing that guidance, we've also learned that being told what to do um, doesn't necessarily always mean tell me the steps to take. It, it can often mean give me some help, point me in the right direction, let me know what my options are. Show me how I can use this flexibility that the Act gives me. Um, I want to know what to do. Um, keep doing what you're doing, that's great, and learn new ways to improve these other things that are not so great. Uh, so it's not always, um, I just want to know what to do, doesn't always mean I want you to tell me step by step how to run my business. And in fact, it very rarely means that. It, re- it usually means that uh, the food business, like many verifiers, are going, hmm, without a set rule, there is a lot of grey area. How do I know that I'm, I'm operating more on the good side of grey than the bad side of grey? And again, so as a, as a verifier, it's up to you to give them that confidence that as long as they're keeping food safety in mind and thinking about it. They might not get the right answer every time, but if they're thinking about food safety and trying to do the right thing, that part of the verifier's job is to help them understand if they're on the right track or not. Um, And if they're not on the right track, then to help them understand how to get onto the right track. So yes, a lot of people do just want to know what to do. They don't want to do the hard work. They don't want to do the thinking. But at the end of the day, they are in this to run a business. They're in this because there's a reason for them to be running that business. And, and they, they want, a lot of them want that control and autonomy. They want to be able to run the business in the best way that works for them or their family or their staff or their customers. Um, and having one way, only one way of doing something doesn't work for most of them, which is why outcome-based legislation is um, important. It's, you know, know what you have to do. Um, keep food risks away from your food. Um, if you can't, take steps to kill them. <laughs> um, if you can't kill them all, at least kill enough that it's probably not going to be um, unsafe for a lot of people to eat. You know, um, you know, be smart about the way that you handle chemicals or uh, think about the things in your environment that get a, can get into food. You know, um, while it might be a bonus to find a diamond ring in a Christmas cake, um, it's not something that people generally want to find uh, uh, people's jewellery or band-aids or uh, fingernails or whatever in their food. So it's it, a lot of it is common sense. You know, the, a lot is written in the regulations and in the guidance, um, but if you break it down, a lot of it is what people will be doing anyway, and in some cases they'll be doing it for completely different reasons. They won't even know that it affects food safety. Um, and sometimes all they're looking for is that um, nod and and reassurance that they're on the right track and they're doing okay. But they're not perfect. They'll never be perfect. Nobody's perfect. And there's probably things that they can maybe improve on or hints and tips or things that they really didn't know. Food safety can be complex. It's it's a science that people go to university for years to learn. Um, And there's food businesses out there that 
um, they'll never go to university to learn it and, and we shouldn't make them. Um, it's about breaking it down and just giving them the handy hints and tips and the options for them to build it into the way that they do business. How can verifiers deal with the language barriers of businesses who don't speak English? Yeah, it's always a tricky one um, when you're, um, but actually, you know, uh, verifiers tend to speak a different language from all food businesses, even when both parties are speaking English. <laughs> so, so it's a challenge anyway. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, the guts of it is, if you know that you're going into a business where English is a second language, have a bit of a plan, have a bit of a strategy. Um, MPI is producing some uh, resources that might be able to help in terms of um, uh, little video clips or information for um, businesses uh, where English is a second language in their own language to help them understand what verification is there to do. So um, as we go through and transition into the new Food, food Act, I think we'll find lots of different strategies but, and businesses will start to help themselves. They'll learn that having uh, somebody there that can interpret for them or to help them understand what the verifier is after um, will actually speed up their verification and lower their costs and so therefore they're likely to make those people available. Um, but also it's about, um, even though you're there to observe behaviours of people um, and to ask questions and to seek um, an understanding of knowledge. You can learn a lot simply by observing behaviours. Uh, and you can, uh, when people come to New Zealand, they may not be proficient in English, um, but very often they understand more than they can speak. And so if you Use simple language, common language that you know. Uh, you know, if you think of learning a new language, there's you know you start with the basics. Um, so if you are able to express ideas using quite basic language and uh, uh, enunciate and uh, speak uh, slowly and clearly, but not loudly, they're not deaf. They're just speaking a different language. <laughs> um, then very often they will pick up what you're saying, but they may not be able to respond um, in kind. Uh, so it's a it's a little bit um, being understanding of that and having some strategies. So whether you've got um, information um, in pictorial form or in translated form that you might not be able to read, but they might be able to. Um, it's about uh, taking the time to understand whether or not they are comfortable uh, reading and writing in their own language um, versus English um, and using the appropriate resources that are available. Um, it, but I mean like there will be times where it, it almost seems impossible um, and in those situations it really is about then um, finding an interpreter. Uh, and, and, and that might need to happen in conjunction with um, you know, an officer or something like that in order to you know, make those resources available so that you can get the answers that you need. But I think um, overall uh, basic language and sign language and lots of pictures can really help when people are um, communicating in different languages. How can I do a thorough and efficient verification without it costing too much? Um, I'd have to ask what people are thinking of as a thorough um, verification. Um, at the end of the day, um, a lot of the, about the Act is about um, people doing the right thing. So it's about behaviours and competencies. Um, and so, you know, the old Act was very much about is the kitchen clean and tidy and easy to clean and did it have coving and white walls and were there a certain number of wash hand basins that were dead easy, you know, we could be lazy regulators and go in and be in and out in 10 minutes and it was all done and dusted. Um, but as I mentioned, that doesn't really tell you anything about food safety. Some parts of the Act say, well, uh, if people follow a plan, they'll make safe food. Well, plans, you know, they're, they're helpful, you know. Uh, uh, it's always good to plan to a certain extent. Um, 
but plans are not the be all and end all either. So while a kitchen can't make safe food and a piece of paper with some words on it can't make safe food, people can. It's all about people and verifiers are people too. And one of the things that we look for in verifiers, are, uh, well a couple of things, are our observation skills. Um, and the ability to put some put themselves in people's shoes, um, but also it's kind of like that X factor, that ability to um, to read a person or situation or to size something up. Um, most verifiers that we talk to can walk into a food business and within the first five or ten minutes tell um, tell the assessor or whoever whether or not that operator is a good operator or a bad operator. They can walk into a food business and they can have a quick look around and they can go, things are looking pretty good here or things are not looking pretty good here. Um, so actually the verifier tends to make their judgment very early on, you know, in the first five or ten minutes. Um, at that point, in theory, they could walk out. Uh, but, but we do actually need a little bit more than that. We need a little bit more than the verifier's gut feel. Uh, so, so that's why we've kind of come up with uh, the top fives. Uh, what are some <coughs> consistent things that you can look for in a food business that um, provide a measure of evidence that things are going okay, that, um, that, that across food businesses of a similar um, kind, uh, that, that this business is doing better or worse or well, or that this sector versus other sectors are doing better or well. or you know. If you're thinking that a thorough verification is going through every possible rule and every possible thing that that business could ever do, then at some point you start wasting time because you've already determined that they know what they're doing. It becomes a, a checklist activity. I know this business is a good business. The five things, the six things, the eight things I've looked at so far tell me that that um, the next thing that I look at they're going to do, do okay on as well. The next thing that I look at they're probably going to be fine. And actually the next thing I look at even if they're not fine it's one in a hundred things that they're doing and that one thing does not make a significant difference to the overall safety of food. So it's really about saying um, thorough doesn't mean everything. Thorough means enough that you walk out of that business confident that in your initial gut reaction. You've tested that initial gut reaction and you're saying, when I looked at these things, they reinforced for me that my gut reaction was right. Or in the first three things I looked at, I realized that my gut reaction was dead wrong. You know, um, and you don't need to do every single procedure, every single rule, every single product, every single person to get that. Um, and, and at the end of the day, even when you walk out, even if you've made a mistake, it's not your fault. If the food business doesn't make safe and suitable food, it's the food business's fault. How does a verifier switch between a food safety officer role and a food verifier role? Really the role of verifier and the role of food safety officer are, are quite different. Uh, the verifier is the educator and the coach and the eyes and ears of that regulator um, and has some responsibilities when they come across stuff that's really, really bad. The first responsibility is to work with the business to ensure that uh, that practice is stopped or changed or um, improved immediately or, or in a time frame that makes sense for that particular corrective action. Um, so I think one of the first things is when something really shitty happens, it doesn't automatically mean that it's now the food safety officer's problem. It's still the verifiers job to help that business to find an appropriate corrective action. It's also part of the verifier's job to say critical things of this nature do need to be reported to the registration authority and then the registration authority has to decide whether or not they're going to do anything more 
than what the verifier has already done or whether any further action is required. A food business um, generally doesn't want to be making people sick and so therefore if something's happening that is of a critical nature and public health is being put at risk, a lot of food businesses will work really happily with the verifier to correct that situation. And it's the verifier's role to be there and to help them to do that. When it's reported to the registration authority, part of the information that the registration authority is looking for is what is the attitude of the food business? Has it been effectively dealt with it? Do I need to get involved? Or are there some other things that need to happen in this regard? Do, is there a food recall that needs to happen? You know, was their attitude actually not that great and uh, we need to come in and apply some sanctions to, uh, you know, to encourage through a stick method rather than a carrot method. You know, so um, you know, is this a case where actually um, you know, a fine is an appropriate um, punishment to further reinforce that you know, in the future you should be uh, making sure that that corrective action sticks. There's a decision point about whether or not um, as the verifier you finish the verification and then at the end of the exit meeting you say and there was this critical non-compliance which would normally be notified up to the registration authority um, but in this case I am the officer that would be uh, asked to make a call on that as the officer I am now taking this action. Um, there are, you could choose to stop the verification at the point of finding the critical non-compliance and um, and switch immediately. It's, it possibly isn't um, isn't the cleanest way of doing things, but it, but it might work for you. Um, it's really about uh, finding finding the process or technique that works for you and your employers and the food business. Um, but being very clear with the communication when you're making that switch. Also, if you are a, a dual officer verifier, um, it is always good to flag in the entry meeting or in the introduction or early stages of the verification um, what will happen. And that's, a, that's something that you need to do as a verifier anyway. What will happen if I find wheels have fallen off? Um, a lot of verifiers, it will be, I'll need to make a call to the registration authority. And, and I remind you that it's also your obligation to report these things. So you should also be making a call to the registration authority. Um, but, uh, or, or, you know, um, but also, um, you know, if I need to switch into an officer, here is my warrant and here's what's going to happen. And being very clear about um, what is the chargeable service for verification versus what is not the chargeable service for um, compliance, unless you are in fact charging for compliance action. <laughs> so just, yeah, communication.